I'd love to do that from the inside. I'd love to do that by yeah. being able to represent South Africa at world champs and being able to say, okay, well, like, just watch, watch the things that the world champions do, the Olympic champions do. How do they prepare? I, I think that goes a long way because like I know in my own experience, if somebody came to me when I was 20 and said, hey, you need to do this. Yeah. I'd laugh them up and be like, what the F do you know? Yeah. Like, it doesn't matter if it was an Alex Pop or, or whoever it was, but you know, by being able to be exposed to somebody on a, on a regular basis and seeing the way they do things, the consistency, the, like all of a sudden I said, like, okay, I, I identify with this. I can see that. Welcome to Social Kick. I'm Brian Lundquist. We got a full crew, Dr. John Mullen, Luke Paddington, and sprinting legend, Roland Schumann. What's going on, Roland? How are you? I'm well. It's, uh, it's a beautiful day in Arizona. I'm grateful that you guys invited me onto the podcast. So, so uh, thank you. Well, uh, speaking of Arizona, how's the real estate market right now? Um, you're a part-time summer, part-time, full-time uh, realtor at an interesting time to be a realtor. So tell me about that. Yes, yeah, it's getting better. I think what I've learned over the time is that there is a lot of fear. Um, as you know, there are various media sources out there, whether it's in the world of swimming or in anything else when it comes to, to markets, et cetera, they try to stimulate or stimulate fear. Um, so I think when our jobs, obviously as realtors and job you guys are doing is to really disseminate what the truth is so it's being able to be on a daily basis really aware of what's going on whether it's you know in the real estate markets in the financial markets being able to relay that information through to our buyers the smart money knows at this point in time that there's very little people to compete against it's not like a year ago where you had 15 different offers on a property now some people are scared about the fact that the interest rates are just over six percent and due to that fact a lot of people aren't buying so uh, like I say, smart money is is purchasing while they can because they they can do it with some with uh, various concessions, um, buy down rates, etc. So it's uh, it's a good time to buy, and you know, it's just sort of my job to be ahead of that and really convey that to the buyers and sellers. How much longer is the Fed going to continue raising interest rates? That's a good question. Um, but I mean, the good thing is, as it keeps going, uh, there's is this inverse relationship, so it's. It's not all bad for for mortgage and uh, and for the real estate world, but uh, hopefully not too much longer. Yeah. All right, enough uh, Brian fishing for info since he's always looking to <laughs> buy his next house. Let's uh, dive into some more swimming related stuff. <laughs> Roland, what would you, or I guess, could you talk us through the last competitive race that you did and what you remember from it? The yeah, last competitive race was leading off a relay. Well, so I I swam the, the KMSC Pro Am in December. Yeah. Uh, in uh, just uh, Louisville and in Texas. Yeah. So I had a bunch of races, but the last race I really did was the 200 freestyle relay leading and all four for Phoenix Swim Club. And it had been, I'd had a whole bunch of races before, didn't expect too much, still went 19, six, I think it was. And it's, uh, it, it was just exciting having a chance to be a part of that team again. And uh, be able to race with a bunch of young, with a bunch of youngsters that see the world slightly differently than I do. Um, you know, I'm double most of their age, so it's uh, it's pretty fun and, and unique experience. I was going to ask. Um, we we have a mutual friend in George Ravel, and for his very last race, um, he chose to have you as his coach. Um, George, I asked George why was that, and I suspected it, but I wanted to hear from George. Um, he says, I suspect I respected him as a rival and understood his experience was very, very valuable. I thought there were things he could see that I wasn't seeing. And I was coaching myself at the time, so there was space for a coach. And um, George really enjoyed his last Olympics. He didn't swim well, but he enjoyed it. He enjoyed the experience with you. And I was always interested to find out about more about that and, and get to know mm -hmm. you, Roland. So what, what is it you think? What did you bring to the table at the end of, of a long career for George Ravel um, that you brought to the table to give to other athletes like George? Yeah, I think the beautiful thing was George and I have been brothers for, for years and we always speak to each other uh, you know, several times a week and especially during swimming, having him coach himself and there was a period of time where I was you know, working with coaches remotely and doing it solo, uh, solo in the yeah. sense that I was the one that had to be in the water, um, had a piece of paper and I was trying to do it to the best of my ability. Right. And, and there, we had a lot of interactions about the struggles of what that, what that feels like. And, you know, 
the doubt that sorts that sort of comes up through the whole experience. And you know, I missed the Olympic trials or missed the Olympic team in 2016. And you know, through continuous, I, I didn't expect George to ask me to be his coach at any single point in time. But you know, he we started interacting about what that felt like and why I thought the the races weren't great. And I spoke to you know the preparations that I'd had on the Jaunty Skinner. I felt that there were certain things that I was missing out on. Um, or that had been overlooked or certain things that I felt like really, really helped. And I think that there was a synergy there. I think George saw a lot of himself in me and, and vice versa. I saw a lot of myself in him. And, you know, I, I think George wanted somebody he could trust, um, mm -hmm. somebody that could go to the Olympics that uh, with him that can say, Hey, you know what? Okay. I think maybe this is the approach that we should ha have. I think when you're going to your fifth Olympic games and you're working with a coach, especially if it's a brand new coach, they might be trying to tell you exactly what it is you want to hear. Mm -hmm. And I think at George, at that point in his life, it, you know, it's like, hey, okay, well, this is your final opportunity. Um, and, and it was really having the mindset of, hey, this is, this is a beautiful opportunity to race. Let's not focus so much on the results, but really focus on what the game is going to be and, and how we can enjoy that to the most uh, because it, it, it's, you know, that was the last one. And, having sort of come to that understanding for myself mm -hmm. being at the 2012 Olympic games and, and really trying to be as professional as possible. Okay. Well, you don't walk too much. You, there's no alcohol before there's no junk food before there's no, this and the consummate professional. And then you get to the Olympic games and it's the same thing. Uh, you, you're steadfast in your approach and sure it might work for some people, but it takes away that the ability to, to really enjoy the moment. And I see a lot of Olympians and a lot of athletes going to the Olympics and getting stuck in that. And they walk away from the Olympics and they're absolutely miserable. And that was my experience. It's, you know, I, and having missed the games in 2016, I was like, you know, I just want to go. I wish I could have gone to Olympic games where I could just enjoy it. Go to the Olympic, walk around the Olympic village, yeah. uh, eat the various foods, go to the, you know, the visa center, whatever it was. It was just like being able to really enjoy everything that made the Olympics because of the understanding that that may very well be the last time that's ever going to happen. And to yeah. walk away from that saying, shit, I, I didn't enjoy myself. I didn't do what I, I could have done. Um, and that's the, ultimately the way it is, is most people look back and say, I should have done more. Yeah. And it was maybe conveying that sort of approach and that understanding as well as the idea, you know, various training methodologies and, and technique kind of things. I, I didn't have to reinvent George. George is a, is an incredible athlete. He's been so, you know, for years and years and years, it was just about getting him to a space, you know, maybe mentally where he could just relax and uh, and not worry so much about everything else. I I I was lucky to spend a day in the village with you and a young Dylan Carter at the time as well, and mm -hmm. I remember how quiet and relaxed and chilled all the whole space was. We were just relaxed since the day before his race or stuff. I mean, you had just come back from a, a workout and you you had gone to the gym and you you're doing a hard workout. Now there's a gym at the village, but that's mainly mm -hmm. for like maintenance. But you only did a, a heavy lift, if I remember. Um, and yeah. you've come and you just had a disappointing 2016, you know, um, not making the, the games like you mentioned. Um, you've continued to compete. Was it seven years later? You just went 19-2 at 42 years old. How do you maintain the power and velocity as you age? There was a, a period, obviously, over the last couple of years that I just didn't want to be in the pool at all. And uh, I actually started getting on the assault bike. Huh. And I was doing six different workouts on the assault bike. Like, um, like really? day one is like a, a, a lactate or aerobic threshold. And through the week, it progresses. And it, it just, it killed me. I think when we swimming five, six, seven kilometers a day, I think it's really good for swimming. But I think as we get older... I felt like I wasn't strong anymore. Like I'd get to a point where I felt so weak because of all the training I'd done, especially, you know, at Alabama, sort of right before that 2016 Olympics, I, I couldn't clean, I couldn't power clean 185 pounds for whatever reason. And I, you know, going into previous Olympics, being able to power clean 235, 245, but now I couldn't clean it once. So there was something in there. So whether it was fatigue and, you know, there was this quote that I, I read years ago is that, fatigue masks fitness and having come from the arizona program it was you know more 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 we have to do more if you're not finishing your race properly it's because you're not training hard enough so the understanding that 
like subconsciously for me, it's like I as I'm feeling worse and worse and worse. I'm I can't act clean 185. It's because I'm not strong mm-hmm. enough. Mm-hmm. because I haven't trained enough and just burying myself into a hole. And after that, it was a bit of a, okay, well, you know, now I have this opportunity at the Olympic games. I was going to do the world cup circuit and that was kind of, that was going to be it for me. Yeah. And I was like, okay, well, let me try and do something different. Let me try and get my strength back. Let me see how much I'm going to swim. And maybe it's a lot, maybe it's not, but I think having spent those several years now working on a salt bike, Developing a greater sense of greater capacity, the ability to 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 work, um, really putting myself into a world of hurt, and then being able to pair that up with three days of strength and conditioning work. Um, I was working with a, a good friend of mine in in South Africa, Wayne Coleman, that works with the Kani Sambini and several other South African track and field athletes. So I think maybe over time, what had happened is because I was doing really strength and conditioning work that was um, primarily based for swimmers, I developed patterns that were maybe great for swimming, but weren't super amazing for being a human being. And I think through changing that stimulus, changing that approach, I was able to gain my strength back. Because now looking at being back in the weight room on Monday, you know, being able to power clean 235 pounds again for three reps and and have it be fairly easy. So it's, that's a beautiful thing. It's like, I think having to completely sever that relationship with swimming at a point and the way I was doing things and experimenting and trying something completely new has really helped. Not only that, but, you know, getting back into a team environment oh. with, with Darian Townsend and the Phoenix Swim Club, mm-hmm. being able to, because I think that's what I missed. I, I love the fact that I had an opportunity to train under the likes of an Aaron Charlo or a Brett Hawk and people that would send me those workouts. So I had different, uh, a way of doing things and maybe an exposure I didn't have. But I think what I really, really missed was being in a team environment with people every single day. So if I was feeling, you know, extra fatigued, I knew there was somebody next to me, or maybe I just wasn't in the headspace to be there on that day. And I'll have people around me say, Hey, you know, Roland, you got this. And just having one person next to you say, Hey, you got this. I mean, we all know what that feels like and the, the energy and excitement that can bring just to help you get through that. So I think I'll definitely attribute the, the strength and conditioning, the assault bike work, and then, you know, getting into a real team setting that, that helped me to a point where I was 19 too. And I, I must admit, going into that meet, there was a lot of scar tissue from the last times I've raced. Yeah. You know, thinking back to, you know, the Mari Nostrum series of how bad I felt those last 25 meters. I felt great for 25 meters and then I'd just die. I'm like, man, I, maybe I am too old. Yeah. But having, you know, gone through this experience and this training with Darian, I just felt like I got stronger and stronger and stronger the more I raced. Being able to back up races, you know, there was the elimination 50s. And I thought, you know, at the very end, I'd go 20 point, but I went 19-2. And, you know, then the next went the 100 freestyle and 50 breast and uh, went the 50 butterfly. It's just, there was so much racing and it's, it was like, it felt good. It was like the first races that have felt so good in so long. And, and, and I, I, a, a big part of me knew that that was within my capacity, but I needed it to happen just to reaffirm that everything that I've been doing is, is the right thing. Yeah, you mentioned one thing about strength and conditioning. And like you said, not maybe being strong on land, yet you were swimming so much and very strong with, with in the pool. And we... In the strength and conditioning world, a lot of people are trending more towards, oh, we want to mimic specific skills out of the water. Personally, I feel like we need to generally increase our overall strength capacity, different capacities on land, and then you get in the water and it will hopefully translate that way with the good coaching, good skills, and the times improving. Because even as much as we want to replicate things on land, they're so much different than they really are in the water. Is this something you've kind of developed or you've seen with yourself or is this something that you think might just have been at the right place and right time for you as you were older? I think it also depends on the athlete. I feel for me specifically the fact that when I started out, I mean, my story swam for three months when I was six years old and hated it. It was the worst thing in the whole wide world, but I was doing every other sport under the sun in South Africa. And Mm -hmm. I was running, I was, I was doing well, I was doing track and field, soccer, cricket, rugby, tennis, everything else under there. So I was building my athleticism. 
Um, I was building my various movement patterns. It was, wasn't just isolated to one thing. And I felt over time, you know, by when I got to high school, I was in my second year of high school and there was a cute girl on the swim team that I came in as a freshman and I fell in love. So it was about, you know, so she was really a fortuitous way to come into the world of swimming. And I think what had helped me up to that point was the various movement patterns that I've developed. And I think getting to Arizona, I'd never, never lifted weights before. The strength and conditioning coach was a, a triple jumper himself. So there was more generalized strength and conditioning work. And I think over time, there's definitely been a shift by a lot of coaching programs to a bit more specific. Uh, well, how do we replicate these movements on dry land? And I'll agree with you 100%, you cannot. There's a loose correlation, obviously, but there'll never be a direct correlation. And I think if your goal is to say, oh, well, we want to correlate, it may not necessarily be the best way to do things. But I think we have to build an athlete. If you look at Caleb Dressel, the fastest dude out there, I mean, look at how athletic he is. You just have to look at the way he moves weights, the way he moves his body. And I think it's, it's if we can develop the level of coordination. So it's having worked with national teams and individuals out there and, and doing clinics, I see that most kids lack the ability to, you know, really coordinate movements, to sort of line up their body and the, the misunderstanding of, of how to move their body. And it's if we can, through strength and conditioning work that is either generalized and maybe at terms a bit more specific, um, help facilitate that development. I think that's the absolute key for, for the growth of, of most any athlete out there. Yeah. Um, Dressel would have been good at any sport. I think yeah. it's like he picks swimming, but it's just clear that he's just an amazing athlete in general. And that's why he has so much hops off the block. I always think it'd be crazy to see what the world would have looked like if LeBron was a swimmer, for example, yeah. you know, you look at some of the best athletes and they just find their way to whatever sport and all due respect. I think Phelps, you know, certainly found, you know, he aligned with his human potential in, in, a, in a great mm -hmm. way. Right. But I feel like there's a lot of times that history doesn't necessarily see that, but in general athletes and um, building athleticism outside of the pool is of critical importance. Agreed. I think there will always be outliers. I mean, I don't know how physically powerful somebody like um, David Popovici is, but you know, he's the world record holder for a reason. So there'll always be those outliers that, may not be the greatest athletes like i mean if you look at michael phelps playing pickleball it, it's clear that he's not a great pickleball player but he's the greatest swimmer of all time you know so it's like maybe he doesn't have the same athleticism as a guy like caleb dressel but he will always well i mean for right now he's still the greatest athlete or olympic athlete of all time so it's, there's those outliers and maybe that's the way they're coached or just mm. just part of who they are but you know we can't always address, you know, the population that we work with, with that goal in mind. Wait, is this a thing? Have you seen Phelps or have you played pickleball with him? Does he suck? No, <laughs> there's something on ESPN um, with him and against Larry Fitzgerald. And oh. he's just, he's just this long lanky. It just didn't seem super coordinated, but I spoke to a mutual friend a couple of days ago. And I said, apparently he's taking it really seriously and he's bought into a pickleball team or pickleball league here in, in Arizona, so he's a bit more uh, active in it. So maybe it's just a question of that was his first time playing it. And if that's the case, I can totally understand somebody just not understanding what they're doing in that minute. That's so funny. Yeah, everybody, he's getting on the pickleball train. Go ahead, Luke. Yeah. I was going to say it's really, really good. I tried it for the first time. I'm still recovering from my shoulder, and apparently I'm all wrist and no follow through. But hey, uh -huh. I wasn't going to let anybody beat me. <laughs> As you shouldn't. <laughs> no way. It's too oh, much it of that so weak tennis. Fun. You remember that where you just like wick it? <laughs> but I tried to hold it like the Chinese hold a tip, the ping pong rocket, and they didn't like, like that that sense of humor either. I was like, <laughs> really? They hold it differently? Uh, no, they it? don't. I was teasing them. Yeah. I was like, this is ping pong, oh. but not. So, yeah. Roland, um, <laughs> it's a treat to get to talk to you because we used to study what you were doing. I mean, so you were the best burner of the world for, for a period of time. And I mean, shoot, you broke the world record short course four times. That was crazy. Um, and when you're on top, no matter who the athlete is, everybody's going to study what you do and try mm -hmm. to learn from, from what they're doing. Um, and, and unless you're doing something really weird, that's only specific to you, but in your case, everything looked so technically sound. Mm -hmm. There were two videos of your races that we used to watch. And 
One of them was leading off the relay in 04 because your reaction time gapped everybody like dramatically. And of course you killed everybody on the start. And yeah. in that era, you were, you were the Caleb Dressel of, of that era. You, you killed everybody off the starts. Um, and the other one is the 50 fly against Crocker in 05 in Montreal when he broke the world record and won the world title. I don't see this very often in swimming. They did a view behind the blocks of you and Crocker side by side diving in. Mm -hmm. And we would pause that video because there's a moment during your start from a straight shot behind that all you see is your feet. And Crocker is a little behind you on a reaction time anyway, but you see all of his legs and he's doing like a pike position. But for you mm -hmm. from, from behind, all you see is your feet, which means your body is in a completely straight line, which was from the outside looking in a huge component of your start. And I remember hearing, I don't know where we got this, but of course I worked with Brad and Aaron Charla and others um, and, and George and trying to understand your philosophy on how you get off the block and then the position that you get your body into mm -hmm. when you're about to enter the water as being um, on the block first, making sure that you are kind of spring loading into mm -hmm. a position where as soon as the start signal goes, all you do is release where some people you see in slow motion, if you watch a start slowly, the start will go and then their reaction, then their heel drops and then mm -hmm. they push. There's like a downward movement and then an upward movement. Yeah. And I remember hearing about your ability to load into a position such that you could just release and then you got into just like a, a tight core and in a straight line in the air and in a different position where it looked like your legs were up much higher yeah. than what a lot of people did take that steep angle. So um, we used to study that. I'm, I really love for you to elaborate on your philosophy on starts and how you were able to master that skill. Yeah. First and foremost, I appreciate you sharing that. It's, uh, it's, it's beautiful for me to hear not knowing that, you guys went into so much depth on something that I valued so much and had spent so much years working on. I think for me, it really started in 96. Uh, South Africa had a sprinter called Brendan Dedekind. And Brendan had really started using his arms to pull. And I, you know, the way I really started working on my start was I used that model. And I set up a video camera at my high school pool from the side, from the front, from the back. And I'd video 20, 30 starts, and then I'd go home and I'd plug it in. And I'd, I'd look at what I was doing. And I'd, you know, I'd spend hours and hours and hours. And then I'd bring my sister to the pool. And then we had a swimming pool at home that had an elevated ledge. And I'd dive in there and I'd do 20 more. And then I'd run upstairs and I'd plug it in. So it was a continuous pursuit of perfection. And you know, it, it, what I'd noticed in most swimmers in the world is most swimmers tend to have this very relaxed arm position on the world um, on the blocks and as the gun goes there is a bit of tension that 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 happens what i noticed when people were relaxed the first movement is a tendency to pull yourself down to a place where you all of a sudden have that dynamic tension and then there's a movement so for me or a movement forward to me that was a wasted wasted energy i wanted to be able to transfer my weight this way as soon as possible so i saw that a lot of athletes had you know sort of both feet flat on the back of the block or on the blocks and then would move that i really try to have well, without the wedges obviously i really try to be on the my the balls of my toe and i had i would i call it dynamic tension so when i if you think about holding onto a bar before you clean or whatever it might be there's there is tension so you kind of set into your lats for me being able to lean slightly back and then be able to pull forward. That was really the key for me is to be able to, to utilize that for my momentum. Um, one thing I noticed a lot of what was happening as well is most swimmers don't kick up their leg. So what you speak to about getting into that, that position like this was based on the fact that I knew that in order to get into that optimal position in the water, because a lot of what you see is as people enter the water, their legs are a bit more flat. And what happens is as they enter, their legs flatten out and there's that dragging as they go through. And 
I just knew that wasn't efficient. I knew that I had to enter the same circle, maybe be slightly deeper. I knew that based on that, I was going to have to increase the amount of dolphin kicks that I did to take it through the breakout. So I spent a lot of time, developed some drills where I taught myself to be better about kicking that back leg up because when that back leg got up, that bottom leg comes up to meet it and you enter the water. So it, it you know, I, I'm grateful that I, you know, knew Brandon and kind of had an idea of what he was doing, but then being able to spend years and hours and, and just forever trying to perfect it. And it gets, got to the point where, you know, I remember asking Rick DeMont certain days at work. I was like, Hey Rick, just watch this. And he'd be like, yeah, that's perfect. I was like, no, but it didn't feel right. So I was working for a feeling and, you know, sometimes, some days I was way too exhausted and I try to keep, keep on going, going, going until I hit that feeling. And the drills that I helped develop for, for kids that I help implement with the national teams and, um, you know, various clinics about how to get that back leg up, you feel it. If you're having your back legs drag when you enter, uh, and it's just that feeling that I kept on fighting for, trying to teach my myself how to do it better and more effectively. So it was a really a lifetime goal to have the best start in the whole wide world. And for me, it was simple. I need to pull my arms as hard as I can. Um, I've gone through periods where you know, I started maybe pulling straight back. Then I had a little bit around. Uh, other times I try to throw my arms over. So it was a continual evolution of what is the best, what is the most efficient. And coming to understand it's not, it's not about the best. It's just about the most powerful. How do I get from here to there as quick as I can, being able to carry my velocity as you know, as well as I can without any energy leak. And I knew that was being able to enter the water like this and not have it slightly like that. So as I enter, everything just drags. You mentioned the arm positions and kind of how to return them. And when you have that, you know, active tension, as you put it, that is one of the biggest things, right? If you use your arms, pull back, you need to get your arms back in front of you. And if you watch Caleb right now, he has a, almost like a butterfly type of action on his arm recovery to the block. Do you think that's something that general and most swimmers can can do and should do? Or do you think you need a certain amount of athleticism to a, accomplish such a you know quick recovery of the arms in, in that position? That's a good question. If you look at somebody like on the other end of the extreme, somebody like Brad Tandy, who uh, I've sort of dubbed it the flying squirrel where he gets those arms to come over and yeah, he's, he's really mobile, really flexible in those issues. But what you're not going to see is the fact that Brad Tandy is dislocated his shoulder several times while doing that start. Yeah. You know, he dislocated his shoulder at the Commonwealth games and the 50 breaststroke uh, and, you know, had to get it back in before he could continue swimming. So, you know, if you're able to do it, and I know that there are people out there that teach that and advocate for just that, but I don't think it's that simple. It's like we got to earlier on, we spoke about Michael Phelps being an outlier. Brad Tanny is an outlier. He was able to do that and had the capacity at, at points to be able to do that. But is that a model that we should be teaching everybody? No, I think the model that we need to teach everybody is the fact that there is a bandwidth, you know, from not using your arms to pulling your arms back this way to maybe being able to recover the arms this way to over the top. And having somebody naturally gravitate to what they're most comfortable with, um, what makes it best for them. Uh, so I, I think it's. I think we should teach the models. I, I think there should be an ability to identify if somebody has compromised you know, movement within their shoulders or doesn't have the thoracic extension, or whatever it might be. Is you know, I think our job as coaches or uh, clinicians is to say, okay, well, can you access those positions naturally? If not, then I'm not going to force you into that with the momentum that your arm is going to take you in. So, and then being able to cater it accordingly. If we identify where the issues are, we can work towards that. But, you know, I think a lot of coaches are like, this is the way. It's not, it's one of many ways. And I think it's, it's important that people do understand that. One of my biggest pet peeves is, and it happens mostly with girls, is people not getting their hands together in a complete streamline yeah. when they enter the water. I don't know why it happens. Every time I see it, I'm like, come on, what, what's going on with that? Does that bother well, you? I hate that. Uh, there, there are a lot of things that bother me. I won't say bother me, but that, that I'm very curious about. Like when I watch Olympians, um, these are the best swimmers in the world. And they're not doing the rudimentary, the, the very basic things when it comes to 
being on the block, the way they use their arms, the way they kick off the blocks, their, their streamlines, the most basic things that at such an elite level would really, would really help them. So whether you're entering, I mean, obviously, you know, there's, if your hands are entering the water like this, you run the risk of, of losing that positioning, but just sloppy streamlines. It's just stuff like that. I, I'm super curious about it. I want to understand that okay, well, you've obviously developed these patterns over time. Has nobody spoken to you about develop or, or changing these habits or, or maybe adopting a better, more beneficial habit. Um, and if nobody has, well, you know, now that you're aware of this, what are the changes that you can start implementing? And if it's somebody that's been aware of this from the very, very beginning, then it boils down to the fact that they're just not taking you know, the time to help develop a or program in a far more beneficial pattern uh, to help them. I just want to say, I'm going to add a disclaimer to those who are listening. This applies to swimming blocks. It doesn't apply to a 10 meter, a five meter or a three meter. Because <laughs> the first time I tried to dive super streamline off the five meter, Talk about the feeling. <laughs> Wait, didn't I tell you that? So we used to do this drill. We used to do a body line drill uh, uh, where we would hang from the platforms and start at the one meter. Well, it couldn't have been one meter because we'd be touching the water. But like we start at three meter and there's three meter, five meter, seven and a half and 10. Mm -hmm. And you would, you would hang by your feet from the platform. And then all you were trying to do was get your body into a really good streamline and you know, enter the water like a really good diver where, feet you know, there's no splash. Though. No, no, no. Oh, you're head, head first. No, no, no. You're hanging from the platform from your feet. So you like get on your stomach and you inch out and then you do a somersault like over the platform, hang from your arms, let your feet hang on the platform. And you enter like this? Or like yeah, yeah. This? And then we'd enter streamline. This is oh the problem. So I, so we were inching up and every time you had a good entry, then you would just go up to the next level. And I did the three meter and then the five meter. And then I moved to the seven and a half and I didn't change to doing it like a oh. diver where you brace with your wrists. I don't know how I didn't <laughs> dislocate my shoulder, oh. but that sure felt like I did. It was the second I hit the water in a streamlined position from like a typical swimming streamline position from the seven and a half meter that hurt like hell. I was yeah. done with that exercise for the day. I honestly don't think I did freestyle for several days after that. <laughs> Roland's been to Trinidad for, for clinics. I know that. And I don't know if you ever went cliff jumping, but we would do that cliff jumping all the time. And it was very dangerous. Um, no, I never, went, I never went cliff diving. I, uh, I just have a general tendency to, to stay away from really extreme things that put my life in jeopardy. I have gone skydiving once, though, but uh, I, I did it reluctantly. That's crazy. Um, I want to go back in time. I want to go back 20 years ago. Um, because I'm interested to, to discuss the events that led up to 2004. So let's go back 20 mm -hmm. years to 2003. World Championships, yep. yourself, Lyndon, Reich, Darian, swim the final at 400 freestyle relay. You finish eighth, right? Mm -hmm. Four seconds back. Um, Canada beat you two, mm -hmm. by two seconds. Then the next year, you managed... How did you manage? How did South Africa... Storied history of swimming, but one-offs, you know, Cameron, mm -hmm. Henny. Uh, I mean, you, you go back to John T breaking world record. You had world-class swimmers, but you managed to get four and even five if you count Nick Folker as well. You had five mm -hmm. world-class 100 freestylers peak at the right time, physically and mentally. What were the events that led up to making that happen? I can only speak for myself in terms of my process and my growth and I think 2002 had the Commonwealth Games and had done done really well considering in 2003, I felt that they, I really had a really good block of training leading up to the point where Rick took the summer off um, mm. uh, as, as far as I can remember, or maybe he didn't, but I'd gone up to Berkeley to train with Mike Bottom. I'd spent the summer in 2001 training with Mike, uh, Mike Bottom up in Berkeley and um, you know, I thought 2003, that'd be a great, uh, another just really good opportunity to, to go up and, and train because I'd won the, the bronze medal with a little bit of Mike's training in 2001. So I, my hope was that a very similar thing. I'd have an opportunity, opportunity to train with the likes of Anthony Irvin, Gary Hall, Bart Kizarowski, and I thought that was going to be the best thing for me. Mike had a lot of commitment, so it wasn't on deck with us a ton at that point in time. And 
I, I got a little bit lazy. So I probably 10 pounds overweight over the summer and wasn't happy with where I was. I thought I'd get to world champs and I swim fast. I didn't. I tied for first reserve in, in the 50 freestyle, had to swim off. I, I was very, very angry to say the least. I didn't warm down. Um, just sat behind the blocks, getting ready for swim off. I raced with, with real anger, touched the wall. The time I'd gone would have seated me, I think, top eight for the 50 freestyle. So that was good, but it was also bad. Uh, and within that time, uh, a lot of F this, F that, I, I hate this. And, you know, I think I'd really grown to be a very, very negative person. I wasn't happy with who I was as a human being. And I wasn't happy with the, and maybe just everything sort of snowballed by virtue of the fact that I just wasn't happy intrinsically. Everything around me just wasn't stimulating or wasn't keeping me or going to even get me happy. And there was a pivotal moment where I got back from world championships and Frank Bush called me into his office and he said, Hey, you know, we need to have a bit of a chat. Mm -hmm. These are the things that I've been seeing over the last year where you're negative. You know, when we give you a set and you're saying, Oh, well, well this is going to suck or I hate this or you know, nobody wants to hear somebody that's complaining. You know, you're a leader on this team and you have been a leader on this team. And, and if you're not going to be that, then, you know, you've done an amazing amount of, of good for this program and we've walked a very long way together, but then it's time that we part ways. And it was very, very difficult for me because here was somebody that I really cared and respected about that was really calling me out. And it was the best thing that he could have done was, was call me out in that moment. And I sat there in tears and, and cried because I had a deep knowledge and a deep understanding of that's exactly who I was. That I'd mm -hmm. just been somebody that was complaining and bitching and moaning and wasn't a really good teammate. And I, I sat in the stadium at McHale and cried for a bit more. And eventually I was like, you know what? He's right. How do I change this? Do I continue on with that, with the bad habits? Because guess what? If I do, I can go anywhere else and maybe I'll be happy for a period of time, but I'm, that's just going to perpetuate itself. That cycle is just going to perpetuate itself. So I have this opportunity now. Mm. I either man up and accept the fact that I haven't been the best teammate and I buy into the program. I do everything that they suggest because, you know, that's going to help my growth and development. And that's what I did. I went down, I changed, went back on deck. Okay, Frank, a hug. I was like, okay, coach, let's do this. I'm in 100%. And there were times over the, the year that I, you know, reverted back. And I think it was instrumental sitting with Rick and Frank and being like, hey, you know, please understand when you see the last seven or eight weeks, I've been really, really focused and committed. And just, you know, there will be that one or two times along the way that I will revert back to my programming that I've been in for years. And it was really buying in for me to the program and my teammates and the coaches around me that helped because then I went from going, you know, really being broken down, going to South Africa in December, racing the, uh, racing the world cup that was out there, then seeing Lyndon go 48, seven off the training we'd been doing 48, eight, breaking the South African record. I was like, well, what, what the F if he can do that, why can't I? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, then going and um, having the my state championships a week later and going 48 six to being like, OK, we, we have something here. Uh, and for Rake, it was a similar thing. Well, now all of a sudden there's two guys that he's training with that are faster than him. And all of a sudden, you know, we, we started pushing each other. There was a competition and we had the conversations with Frank and Rick and he said, you know, it's like you guys need to understand. Now you have three guys that are 48 high, 49 low, you need to find one more. And there's Darian, there's Nick, there's a guy called Carl Tanning. Mm -hmm. So there are several people. Can you buy into this goal? Because maybe you go to the Olympics and there's no guarantee that you win an individual medal of any kind. But by virtue of the fact that you have three other people, you have a shot now because there's nobody in the world had three or four, nobody had four guys in the world going 48 seconds. We just had three. So it's like, well, what can we do? 
trained again, pushed each other. Like Rake and I were, were gym partners and it was a continuous like pushing each other, driving each other. We bought into each other. It, it, we became about something greater than ourselves. It wasn't just about me, my pursuit. It was like, this is a team. And the beautiful thing was there was nobody in the world really believed we could do it. Not even our country. They didn't want to send a relay to the Olympic Games in 2004 because they didn't think we could win a gold medal or even final. So it's just, you know, I think all of that being the underdogs really helped drive us. You know, I, I think Frank and, and Rick ha helping facilitate that growth and that partnership and the, the sense of team what was absolutely paramount because Rake's always had always been very much an individual. I'd always been an individual. Lindman was a, just a happy-go-lucky, you know, individual team. He could race in any, any situation and get the best out of his team and um, himself. But then it was really after the, the Olympic trials in 2004 where Darian kind of stepped up as that youngster. It was now about getting Darian to buy into what we believed could happen. You know, it was continuous phone calls, text messages, emails, um, just continual touches of, hey, how are you doing? How are you feeling? Well, this is where we are. You know, this is, this is what we believe we can achieve. Uh, it, it was really, so, I mean, that's, that's really how I really got to that point. And it, it was, it's just so exciting to, it's so, so cool to think back to seeing that the, you know, the growth I'd undergone from end of world champs in 2013 to a year later, and so many of us put off that opportunity for growth because it hurts us. So it, it was all four of us being able to you know, really forget about it, not forget about our individual goals, but be focused so much so on, on one specific you know, objective of being a team and, and, and doing everything we can for that team. It's like I remember one of my my most fun workouts was we knew it was going to be outdoors and we knew that the wind was going to be blowing in Athens. So what we did is we did a 400 freestyle relay at U of A long course. And we took the aerators and we put the aerators in at various places just, you know, against, so you'd be swimming against the current from the side. So, and, and we, and it was like, we can do this. doesn't matter what the circumstances are. If there's wind, we're going to win. If there's rain, we're going to win. If there's sunshine, we're going to win. It's like the gods are smiling on us. It, on that day, it was our given Sunday. And it's like we we just knew. Just two things that stood out for me on, on the line. Um, how, how, how rare that is. You think about Kenya has the two done for the summer at the same time. Trinidad had Dylan and George who were pretty good shape at the same time. But they get three and then four. It was such a rarity and such a good culture, but not beyond that. How y'all put yourselves aside and went for the bigger purpose months, year before the, the, the games. If imagine if America did that, imagine if Australia did that, imagine if Kyle was was texting Zach and Sarity and say, "How is the training going? Let's get ready." Like what you did and went beyond yourself and for South Africa is remarkable. So I appreciate that um, big time. But I mean, I think if you look at the Australian team in 2000, I, I right. think they led or planted a seed within our heads as well because mm. they seem to have that relationship, that care for each other, the brotherly love of, I'll die for these people. And, and I, I don't care what I have to do to get there. And you see the friendship that they still have years and years later. Yeah. And, and I think they planted that seed for us to know that it was possible to beat the mighty Americans. And I do feel like uh, I agree with you hundred percent. If other teams out there really invested in that, what would be possible? Now back to the specific race. Um, I think we all watched it again recently and it, it really is a, a special race, the, the 400 relay, mm -hmm. but I'd love to hear what you specifically remember from maybe your lead off leg. I know most uh, swimmers we asked this and you don't remember much from your specific leg, but maybe mm -hmm. if you remember anything from your leg and then your teammates' legs. Yeah, I uh, I was so nervous between heats and finals because we were the same team. We didn't have alternates. And I remember eating chicken and rice and the chicken at that point is just so dry. <laughs> like you're eating a couple of bites of chicken and then having to swallow it down with huge gulps of water because there's so much nerves. And warm-up felt so good. Uh, it just, 
like everything was moving well, it just felt great in the water. And, and I think when we got to the pool, all of a sudden there's that shift from nervousness to, to excitement and focusing on, on the possibility of things rather than, you know, focusing on something that could potentially be a negative or what happens if we don't. All of a sudden it's like, once again, what we've been training for is there's a possibility we can do this. And yeah, it, it was so cool because I remember standing in the ready room and I, it just impervious. I was standing in front of a big TV and Popoff was behind me. And, um, and he was trying to watch the races that were going on. And I just, I, I was just so in the zone. I was just watching and, and Popoff, you know, said in, in his Russian accent, he's like, Roland, Roland, is your dad a glass maker? So obviously insinuating, well, I'm not see through. And I was like, Oh my God, you know, my dad. <laughs> so, I mean, it just it, like nothing could phase us in that moment. And, and it was just like, I mean, my dad had passed when I was 13, but it's like, it just in that, I could have all of a sudden been like, Oh, well, F you, who do you think you are? You don't know my dad. I don't know. I'm not and, and have it affect me, but being so ready and in the right place to look at the greatest sprinter of all time at that point in time and, and laugh it off. But standing behind the blocks, I was, I mean, if you look at the fa in my face, I was just like, this is it. I know this. I feel this. I'm getting goosebumps thinking about it right now. But it's like I knew in that moment. It's like I need to get out hard. I'm going to take it out as fast as I can. And you know what? If you can catch me, awesome. Catch me. But you're not. So I remember the race strategy was no breath for the first six strokes. Really super light for those first uh, or the, the next four strokes and then try and lengthen into my stroke, into the wall, as soon as I turn, you know, gun the legs, for, try and finish as hard as you can. And I remember getting to a point about 10 meters out, everything had just, I got in, one, two, three, four, five, six, breath, extra light, da -dum, da -dum, and then attacked the wall, came in and out. And I remember getting to a point about 15 meters out where I was like, oh, these legs are starting to burn. And the thought was, doesn't matter finish you got to you got to get to the wall first so that rake and london and them could uh, could have as much of a lead as possible and i didn't realize how far ahead i was i knew coming into the uh, pushing off the wall that i was streets ahead of anybody but you know climbing out and then seeing london going baba you know those straight arms of he's just going and i think well, there was a little fear in is darian you know, he, he was amazing this morning. Is he going to be able to, you know, be there in that moment, be present, not think too far ahead? And he just did absolutely fantastically for an 18-year-old kid with that amount of pressure, uh, everything on the line, to go in third with that much of a lead. You know, he didn't relinquish anything. And then when it came to Rake, I knew that, okay, well, Rake, Rake he has got so much history in terms of anchoring relays and doing well and, and that's sort of what we knew it's like that was the order i knew i was going to be first because we wanted that lead rake was mm -hmm. going to anchor because he is you know was the most experienced at that point in time london and i had practice takeovers all the time the unknown at that point in time was darian so it was darian was going to be third just in case we want to be as far ahead as possible we're not going to swim this from behind because that's there's no way we're going to win the race that way so you know, when Rake dove in and turned, I, we, I was pretty excited when he dove in and we were so far ahead. But when he turned and started coming back, knowing that Rake has the endurance he has, I was like, okay, we got this. We got this. We got this. And as he starts coming in, it's like building that, ex that excitement and touching the wall and throwing our hands up and, and going crazy. And like a, one of the last things I'll speak to is London. He gets a South African flag off. Um, <laughs> from the crowd and he hops up onto the blocks and he like bends down to shake Rake's hand. And, and I remember very, very vividly in that moment, we'd had a relay disqualified against ASU. So U of A, uh, University of Arizona had swum against ASU. And it was the first time we were ever gonna beat ASU in a dual meet. And we won the 400 freestyle relay. We needed to go one, three to win. We went one, three and Rake was like, come on in, like celebrate. So we jump in and we're celebrating and one of the, one of the other relays hadn't finished. So by virtue of that, our relay got disqualified. 
and Lyndon was standing on this block, leaning, leaning down. I was like, oh my God, he's going to, he's going to fall in. We're going to get disqualified. We're going to lose the medal. So you'll see in the video, I, I grab him by the arm, kind of pull him back. I'm like, just don't do it. Don't fall in, please. Like this is, this is our shot. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, I, I want to bring it now to 2023. Um, talk about. I would like you to talk about the your the state of South Africa swimming right now, and I'll give a little prelude. So right now you got some world class swimmers once again as usual. We're seeing somebody called Chad Declo 2.0, yep. young Matt Sates, Peter Kotz, the back, back stroker, the two breast strokers, and a big champion world record holder on the women's side. Um, but still, we're still hearing about the financial struggles and, and the lack of yeah. support and, and, and the issues even these elite athletes are having, these proven Olympic gold medalists are having. Mm -hmm. um, what's your, are you excited for South Africa swimming now? Are you still worried? What's your opinion on the state of South Africa swimming? It's a bit of both. I think there was a bit of a lull in there. Um, you know, Chad, we had Zane Waddell and, and mm -hmm. he retired. And I think that was a big loss for, for swimming in South Africa. Um, I, I think it's beautiful that we have the Lara van Niekerks, we have Tatiana, we have women now that are mm -hmm. separating themselves as world beaters because before it was Penny Haynes and we didn't have anybody after that that the younger athletes could identify with and really say, hey, oh my gosh, this, this woman represents South Africa and she's done a training in South Africa or abroad or wherever and I can be just like her. So I think that was missing from South African swimming, in, especially on the women's side for a long period of time. Um, Tatiana is an absolute sweetheart. She trains well. She's coached by Rocco Mayering. And the great thing that I, I know about Rocco and respect is he understands that he has certain coaching capability and he's willing to then seek guidance from people that are smarter than him in other areas. You know, my experience with a lot of coaches in South Africa was it was a very closed model. Um, I'm not going to give you too much information because I don't want your swimmer to beat my swimmer or my swimmer to go and start training with you um, because then I'm not going to be on a national team. And obviously, it's, a, it's my experience with a handful of coaches, not the entire you know, group of coaches within South Africa, but it was something that I saw more frequently, whereas when I came to America, I felt like all of the coaches were if I went and sat down with Brett or Aaron or anybody and say, Hey, you know what? I've got the struggle or I'm uncertain of how to do this or just as simple as, Hey, what do you see? They'd really be willing to share. Mm -hmm. So I, I feel like a lot of that has changed now. And that's why you're starting to see uh, you know, more and more champions. I, I still think that we're a little weak in the male sprints, um, mm -hmm. which is surprising. I'm not sure why I, I have been so disassociated with, most of the swimming programs in South Africa. So I couldn't really you know, put a pin on exactly why that would be. The financial issues are real. Uh, they have been. They, we pointed them out in 2001, 2004, 2008, through, throughout the time. I think a problem lies in the fact that Swimming South Africa is, is a government agency. Um, mm -hmm. Our Olympic Committee is a government agency. Uh, our current government has embezzled and stolen hundreds of billions of dollars. So it's the money that has been earmarked dedicated for performance really doesn't see the athletes. So when you find an athlete like a Tatiana or a, or a Chad or a Matt Sates that can start earning a living and, and you know, travel and compete and, and pay for all the costs associated with their growth and their development and their performances, um, they excel. I, I think we as South Africans do a lot of, oh, we're incredibly successful in spite of the conditions that we have. Like mm -hmm. the pool in Pretoria where Tatiana and them train, the, the heaters regularly go out and then they're training in 16 degrees, 17 degrees Celsius water. And that's just, just what you do. Um, so it's not, not like you hear you train at a world-class facility and guess what? If the water is now all of a sudden 76 Fahrenheit as opposed to 79 or 80, well, yeah. I, I can't do this. Yeah. You know, so I think a lot of South Africans are just tougher. That was my experience coming here. Things that would bother certain people. I'm like, oh, this is great. Water's only two degrees colder than it should be. It could have been 10 degrees, which is what I'm used to. So, uh, there's a lot that needs to change. Uh, I've kept on fighting it, fighting for it. I 
put my name in the hat for Minister of Sport several years ago. I was kind of laughed off by, by a lot of people. And, but ultimately, I, I think what we need is a, a government that is less focused on them and what they stand to gain. And you know, what do the people need? What do the athletes need? And, and you see the same faces at Swimming South Africa that have been there for the last 5, 10, 15 years. And if you're running a company into the ground, and you've done it for the last two or three years, guess what? You're going to get fired. But unfortunately, in you know most third world countries, that just isn't the case. And Luke, I'm sure the experiences are similar. And you, you have a familiar understanding with that um, in Trinidad and Tobago and, and, and have seen that. And unfortunately, that's just the way it works. And yeah. you know, I, I think as an athlete for myself and, and maybe through connections, it's going to be about facilitating sponsorships or a trust creating a trust that will help in the performances uh, maybe earmarking certain talent whether it's elite talent um, and then juniors and then development and being able to help them prepare adequately for the games and not have them rely on any specific funding that comes in from the the government or from Swing south africa because chad's fine he makes more than enough money tatiana's mm-hmm. fine but it's yeah. that level just below if they're not getting money, how are they prepared? Yeah. How are they going to be able to race uh, to the best of their abilities? And they're not. I, I, I know what the fear is like when you're like, I, I have to win this race or I have to get top three in this race to get $500 because guess what? If I don't make $500, I'm not going to have paid for this flight. Yeah. Or I'm not going to yeah. have paid for my hotel and having that continuous perpetual state of stress, yeah. uh, it, it, it's impossible to thrive on a, on a long-term basis when you just marked with a level of dis-ease every single day. It's like being able to compete with that sense of freedom. And you can see it in Chad now. You can see yeah. he's happy again, that smile. It's like when, when you have that freedom and that relaxation, that's when you can perform your best. And even if he doesn't swim his best in that moment, guess what? He's still free. And then that freedom goes across to the next race. The, the, the greatest cricket players in the entire world, no bias, are the West Indies. <laughs> and, um, and yeah, yeah, yeah. And we've we, we've struggled recently, but uh, just a couple of weeks ago, Brian Lara has has been brought on as the performance mentor for the team. Amazing, um, which is which is fantastic. Uh, you got two young swimmers who were born the year you guys won the gold medal, almost born the year. Peter and Matt. You got Chad. Mm-hmm. You got a potential four by two lining up for eighteen months from now. Is there a role for Roland to help? Anyway, do you mentor any of these athletes at all? And put them, I believe you guys have three potential four by two guys. Yeah. Is there a rule? I, I've offered my assistance to Swing South Africa, to various coaches in South Africa. And I've been met with, you know, I won't say criticism, but I've been met with resistance. I don't know if they. Yeah, I've been very vocal about athletes coming to America and being able to prepare here. Uh, less so now than, than I was before. And right. maybe they still function from a place of, well, all Roland's going to do is trying to convince my athletes to come. For me, it's, it's that mindset. There's that missing mindset piece and, and the belief. I, I'd love to do that from the inside. I'd love to do that by yeah. being able to represent South Africa at World Champs and being able to say, okay, well, just watch, watch the things that the world champions do, the Olympic champions do. How do they prepare? I, I think that goes a long way because like I know in my own experience, if somebody came to me when I was 20 and said, hey, you need to do this. Yeah. I'd laugh them up and like, what the F do you know? Yeah. Like, it doesn't matter if it was an Alex Pop or, or whoever it was, but you know, by being able to be exposed to somebody on a, on a regular basis and seeing the way they do things, the consistency, the, like all of a sudden it's like, okay, I, I identify with this. I can see that. I'd love to. Um, okay. I've had the opportunity to do so many clinics with, with Fitter and Foster. I worked with the Singapore national team yeah. with Brent Hayden and the Canadian national team. So I've had those pieces. Um, It'd be an honor for, for me to continue doing it for, for the country that I love, that I grew up in and, and was born in. And, and if it's not South Africa, for, for anybody else that, that sees a, a benefit in, in what I might have to offer. Roland, just some rapid fire questions before we let you go. Cool. Who's the hard, what's the hardest race in swimming? Oh, 200 butterfly. 
Olympic gold or world record? Olympic gold. What advice do you have for someone who's the top qualifier in their first Olympic final? Smile. Yeah, oh, it's beyond that. Okay, so I, I have to unpack that. It's with being seated number one, there is so much pressure. All of a sudden, you are the, the lead dog. It's now all of a sudden the target's on your back. What happens in that situation is people start tightening up. Breathe, relax. When you're standing on the, behind those blocks, don't get trapped in that, <sighs> that, that state of stress of breathe. Nice and calm, in and out. Just do what you've done. That's, that's it. Who's the best starter all time? Me. What's your favorite racing suit you ever wore? Mizuno. The jammer or the full suit? No, well, uh, arena full suit. The, uh -huh. uh, I think that was the X glide. And then uh, the, just the jammer would be the Mizuno. What's the best advice a coach ever gave you? <laughs> best advice a coach ever gave me is unless you change the way you're doing things, you're not welcome here anymore. <laughs> which, uh, which of your competitors brought out the best in you? Rick Nittling. You started swimming to get a girl. What was the pickup line? I don't have to use water wings anymore. <laughs> <laughs> What's the best race that you ever saw live? Best live or oh, race I ever saw live. Probably Chad Leclerc beating Michael Phelps in that 200 butterfly. That was a good one. All right, Tom Brady just retired at 45. How long do you see yourself training and racing at a high level? At least till I'm 46. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, what a beautiful testament to somebody that has believed in themselves, that has had the financial ability to achieve, because I think we're going to see more of it. I, I think you see right now somebody like a Nicholas Santos maybe a Dara Torres as an outlier in the past. It, it was really done by the fact that they were able to. And I think there's this idea that uh, when you're 35, you're too old. When you're 38, you're too old. Well, basically, as soon as you reach your 30s, you're too old. And that's based on convention, conventional wisdom. We have not had ability or for a, a history of people and athletes being able to prepare well into their 30s, 40s, and 50s uh, because professionalism has not allowed for it to happen. You see Tom Brady as the perfect example of somebody that is a consummate professional in everything they do, the way they interact. They are a professional to a T, and we're going to see more and more and more of it, not less. Last one. Do you enjoy doing social kick? I did. This has been really cool. <laughs> do you do it in the pool? We do. Uh, there, the odd occasion when Darian thinks we deserve a break, He'll say, all right, yeah, you guys can do a 300 social kick. But this oh, is yeah. my favorite kind of social kick. Mom, I, just wanna, I, like I want to touch on that full circle quickly, how you were Darian's mentor and now he brought you back into the sport. It's really yeah. interesting and lovely, isn't it? So I think it's, uh, I, I think it is beautiful. It, yeah. you know, how cool would it be? So Marlise Ross that trains with us dreamt uh, a couple of weeks ago that I won the gold in paris and she handed me a flag i was like imagine if that's an epiphany i'm not saying that is or yeah. you know, there's a lot of that will go into just making those olympic games but how beautiful that would that be um yeah like a, when i saw anthony win the olympic gold medal in 2016 i was like wait hold my beer uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh that's awesome uh, Roland, it's a real treat to get to talk to you. Uh, my, my first ever meet to witness live at a high level was 2002 NCAAs, and I got to watch you and Irvin duke it out yeah. as, a, as a high schooler going into to college, and that really introduced me to what elite swimming is all about and made realistic some of the times that you guys were doing. So for that and all of the influence on just how to, how to be a professional and, and how to be good at swimming, thank you. Um, thank you. Thanks so much for spending the time with us. It's a, it's a real treat, and I uh, appreciate you coming on. Yeah, I want to thank you all for what you're doing. Like, what a beautiful avenue to introduce the world to swimming and what goes on behind the scenes because most people only see those races and they see the victories or the failures, but very few people get to see the process that goes into the development of an athlete, the struggles that they've had, um, the highs that they've had. And when 
we don't always relate to the winning of the gold medals or the breaking of the, gold, of the world records, but we can relate to the hard work. We can relate to the trials and tribulations. So for the avenue that you've created and the message that you help share, thank you so much. Thanks for that. Well, with that, it's a great place to end it. Um, that's it for this episode of Social Kick, and we'll see you next time. Hey, everybody. Thanks for hanging out with us. If you're enjoying Social Kick, tell your friends about it, and be sure to tell us what you liked by leaving a comment and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Follow us on Instagram. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel, The Social Kick, and you can find all of our content on our website,